Um, anyway, uh, Tasman, although she sounds very much like an Australian these days, is actually a native South African. She got her PhD at Wits uh, University and has done lots of interesting work there, uh, primarily on mammals and mammal behavior. And today she's going to talk to us about, again, something I wasn't quite expecting, which is an integrated understanding of parental care in mammals. Thank you, Tess. So thank you, Bill. Uh, this is not going to be a conservation focus or ecological focus. Much of what I'm going to be discussing today is actually motivated by some of the work that I've been involved in for the last well, 17 years now on this species, the African striped mouse. So it celebrates 20 years of research on parental care behavior. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run you through a brief introduction. I'm going to talk a little bit about why an integrated approach to understanding paternal care is important. Um, I'll talk about the behavioral machinery of paternal care, look at the factors that affect the onset activation and maintenance of paternal care. And then I'll look at some of the adaptive um, significance and evolution of paternal care, some of those hypotheses. And then I'll end it with a summary of the stuff that we know and the stuff that we don't necessarily know. So paternal care can be defined as any non-gametic investment that's made by fathers post-fertilization that may directly or indirectly affect an offspring's growth, um, behavior, uh, growth development or survival. Um, now, these direct behaviors may include things like huddling or grooming, uh, while indirect behaviors include things like territory defense as well as um, things like alarm calling. Now, paternal care is really rare in mammals. It occurs in only 5 to 10% of species, and this is probably a consequence of males not actually being, a, being able to actually care for offspring because they are bundled away in the mother's womb or in the mother's pouch. So this frees up males to actually go off and seek additional mating opportunities. Now, in 1963, Nico Tinbergen, in an attempt to organize the discipline of animal behavior, he actually wrote a paper called On Aims and Methods in Ethology. And it's the seminal work in the study of animal behavior. And in this paper, Tinbergen actually separates out the proximate causes from the ultimate factors. And he stresses that it's really important to look at behaviors from both of these perspectives. So the proximate factors are things like the mechanisms, so maybe hormones that underlie the expression of behaviors, whereas um, the development is ontogeny, so how the, the individual actually grows and develops into that behavior. When we think about the ultimate factors, these are things like the adaptive significance, so what is the function of the behavior, as well as its evolution. So in order to understand behavior in its entirety, we really should be taking an integrated approach. So what I'm going to do today is try and demonstrate how we can take this integrated approach to have a broader understanding of paternal care in mammals. And as I say, this is motivated from a lot of work that we've been doing on the African striped mouse. It's what I started doing my PhD on and I'm still involved with the striped mouse project today. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run you through the background of the proximate factors, the ultimate factors, as well as the evolution and um, function of these particular behaviors. Now I'm talking about paternal care broadly. So paternal care is actually made up of lots of different behaviors, but I'm gonna talk about it um, quite broadly. So look at a few different behaviors. And I'm using the species, the African striped mouse as a model for mammals. Why is it a good model? Well, aside from being deliciously cute, that's one of my males there and he's not eating uh, the offspring. He's being a really good dad and returning it back to the nest. This is a great model species because it's the only African murid rodent that we know of that actually shows paternal care in the field. But paternal care is highly flexible. So in this pop, uh, particular population that I'm going to be talking about or the species, the males can actually show one of three reproductive tactics. They can be solitary roamers, they can be territorial breeders, or they can be phylopatrics. And if they're phylopatrics or territorial breeders, they show paternal care. But if they're solitary roamers, they don't show paternal care. So there's a lot of flexibility in the system from social organization all the way down to paternal care behaviors. So this makes them a really good model for trying to untangle some of these factors. I should also stress that I'm going to give you some of the theory that underlines all of these different components. And a lot of that theory is derived from lots of different mammals. 
But a lot of it is, as I say, it's theory and there's hypotheses. And not always do we have evidence to support some of these theories. So what I'm going to try and do is give you some evidence that we found for striped mice, but also maybe uh, talk about some other species along the way. And I do apologize. There may be some big words, uh, particularly when we talk about the brain. So please don't go to sleep. Uh, I will hopefully, hopefully try and make it a little bit more simple for you. So I'm going to start by talking about the behavioral machinery. So this is the brain and the central nervous system. So when we look at paternal care and naturally biparental species like prairie voles and California mice, we do have quite a good understanding of what's going on in, in there. And so what we know is that paternal care is actually regulated by a neuronal complex that consists of these three parts of the brain here. So the medial preoptic area, the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis, and the medial amygdala over here. Now, the medial amygdala might be particularly important for paternal care because it's actually very uh, heterogeneous in terms of its neuronal diversity, and it's receiving information directly from um, the accessory olfactory bulb, which is that little pink and purple bit over there. Now, why is that important? Because particularly for rodents, olfaction is the dominant sensory modality. And many of the social behaviors um, that we see in rodents and in many other mammals actually are strongly regulated by olfactory cues. So rodent olfactory systems in particular are phenomenally complex. They're incredibly precise. You're talking one gene per neuron. So that's very, very, very precise. And this is going to allow individuals to basically recognize and describe discriminate a huge array of um, odorant molecules, so a huge diversity. Now, we have two main olfactory systems that we find, particularly in rodents, as well as other mammals uh, to a greater or lesser degree. And these are the main olfactory system and the vomeronasal system. So the main olfactory system, which is this nice little blue section over here, houses approximately 10 million neurons in the, that sit in that main epi, uh, olfactory epithelium. Now, you can see that it's sitting right in the nasal airstream. So rodents don't even have to actively sniff in order to, to detect odorant molecules. Basically, they just have to be around volatile stimuli. So this is really, really cool. These animals are picking up um, lots of stimuli and they can respond accordingly. Now, all of these uh, little neurons in the main olfactory, bowl, uh, main, um, olfactory epithelium collide here or collect here in the main olfactory bulb. And these basically, um, it's a really important part of the brain that we know of for paternal care behavior. So in naturally biparental species, species, if you disrupt the main olfactory bulb, you actually impair paternal care. And so this causes disruptions, it uh, causes things like uh, increased aggression and infanticide towards offspring, which is uh, pretty cool. Well, maybe not for the offspring, but it's pretty cool to know that this is what's happening in this part of the brain. The vomeronasal system uh, or vomeronasal nasal organ of the vomeronasal system is phenomenally sensitive. So it sits down here. And in rodents, it is extremely morphologically complex. It's the greatest in uh, terms of complexity of any mammal species. So rodents are particularly phenomenal when it comes to detecting odor cues. So we know that uh, these little neurons that project from the vomeronasal organ, they project up here to the accessory olfactory bulb, and then they move to different parts of the brain. So this triggers uh, cascades of impulses to the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis, the medial amygdala, as well as to the hypothalamus. And these basically then send their signals off to the medial preoptic area, and this triggers a huge cascade of neuronal impulses all of which basically collect down here into this part of the brain, which is the ventral, ventral tegmental area. Now that area is part of the brain's reward system. So offspring are a really strong reinforcing stimulus for males. So it's basically saying to males, look after me, I'm really, really important. And it reinforces this and it provides in effect a mental reward for, for males. Now we know this from uh, naturally biparental species. So we think this is uh, quite a, a conserved pathway. And indeed in striped mice, it's just been found this year that this pathway is important for paternal care in um, African striped mice. So Chu and Penup, um, who is an undergraduate student at Princeton, 
they actually have recently found that there's increased expression uh, in this part of the brain of a particular gene. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. So in terms of the neural circuitry, so that the behavioral machinery that's underlying uh, paternal care, it does appear to be quite highly conserved in male mammals in general. So it does seem to be that there is this consistent pattern, regardless of how flexible paternal care might be, it does seem that there is quite a conserved pathway um, for paternal care. But we also know that paternal care can be modified by other behavioral or other factors, which are then going to be leading to behavioral changes. So when we talk about behavior in general, behaviors can be affected by organizational effects as well as activational effects. So neural pathways for paternal care are actually, or any other behavior are probably first going to be organized um, hormonally when the, the offspring is still an embryo. And these will then, um, these little pathways will later be activated in adulthood. So when we think about organizational effects, these are caused by particular types of hormones, and they cause permanent non-reversible changes in the neural substrates of the brain during early critical periods. So you can imagine that they're actually making little pathways in the brain um, for these behaviors. These organizational effects might actually directly affect the physical machinery, but they might not be the ones that allow for the onset and maintenance of behaviors later as an adult. So then we start to look at other types of hormones which cause activational effects. So activational effects tend to be reversible um, and they are modifying these neural pathways or the neural activities in these pathways. And this causes alterations in behavioral state um, in adulthood. So activational effects are probably what's really um, driving a lot of this flexibility in paternal care that we see in striped mice. Now, several hormones have been implicated in the onset and maintenance of parental care behaviors, so maternal care as well as paternal care. But the roles are equivocal, they're species specific, and their effects are likely to be influenced by interactions with other hormones that are going to be doing other things and have other functions. And a lot of these hormones that I'm going to be talking about also have other functions besides their involvement in parental care. Now, unfortunately, a lot of the work that provides the basis for our understanding here, come from species which are not actually naturally parental or naturally paternal. So these are things like Norway rats or laboratory rats and laboratory mice. So a lot of this is not necessarily coming from naturally paternal species. And also a lot of it is also coming from the maternal side and we don't necessarily have good evidence from the paternal side in some species. So the first hormones I can talk about are the steroids. So um, this is testosterone and estrogen. Now, we know that paternal care can be promoted through aromatization of peripheral testosterone into estrogens in, again, this medial preoptic area here of the brain. Um, this is just a pretty picture to show you that, yes, you do see increased expression in some species. So this one is from, I think, a little laboratory mouse. Now, in 2009, some of my colleagues actually showed that when we um, measure testosterone in these males, uh, African striped mice, of these different reproductive tactics, it's our male uh, aromas, these guys over here, who have much higher levels of testosterone than our territorial breeders down here. Now, at first glance, this makes a lot of sense because these territorial breeders are actually caring for offspring, so they're paternal, and you don't want to be aggressive to your offspring. But the problem here is that these guys are also caring, or can I use this one because I keep pushing the arrow, there we go. These guys over here are also aggressive, dominant um, males who are protecting harems. So you would expect high testosterone here. So we seem to be seeing a trade-off between te a low testosterone amicable behaviors and high testosterone uh, sort of dominance behaviors playing out in our strike mice here. This reduction in testosterone is important probably for the manifestation of paternal care in striped mice because of the suppression of testosterone um, is going to uh, basically mean these animals are not going to be as aggressive towards their own young. But we also have another uh, hormone, which is the neuropeptide oxytocin. Now, oxytocin is well known for its role in sexual behavior, affiliative behavior, particularly maternal care behavior, as well as some aspects of paternal care in some species. 
And it's secreted by the posterior pituitary and basically moves around the general circulation. It's thought not necessarily to play a role in the onset of care, but it's thought to basically help maintain it. So once offspring are born for the mothers, this um, oxytocin helps to maintain her maternal care towards her own young. So we think that oxytocin is an activational um, effect. So it's going to basically be activated by these offspring stimuli, these, these odor cues along that pathway that I showed you um, first. So from the vomeronasal organ, all the way, all the way, all the way to the ventral tegmental area, that nice reinforcing um, reward pathway. So if we have a look in striped mice, we actually find that breeding male striped mice, and it's not particularly evident from this picture, it's not the greatest one, but it's the best one that I could find. We find that our breeding males actually have higher concentrations of oxytocin in this part of the brain, which is the paraventricular nucleus, a part of the brain that's also associated with this pathway. The breeders have higher testosterone, uh, oxytocin. The Romas have lower oxytocin. And the phylopatrics um, uh, also have low oxytocin. So what we think may be happening is that the oxytocin in the male brain is priming these males to provide paternal care to their offspring. But because these males also provide paternal care when they're phylopatrics, we think that something else is probably going on to stimulate alloparental care when those males are younger. So we think that there might be two different sorts of mechanisms initiating parental care, depending on whether you're an adult or whether you're a juvenile. But oxytocin interacts very strongly with another hormone called vasopressin. And there's very, very complex interactions between these two things. Now, we know that testosterone actually stimulates the synthesis of vasopressin, um, again, via activity of these estrogens. And in some species, it does appear that vasopressin is involved in paternal care. And we might see um, basically uh, increased pup-directed behaviors and things like that. And we see this in laboratory mice. And we also see it in some naturally biparental species like uh, prairie voles. Unfortunately, in striped mice, it doesn't seem to work that way. So in striped mice, it's not our breeders who actually have higher levels of vasopressin. It's our romas. So our romas are showing much higher concentrations of vasopressin. Now, it's quite possible that maybe vasopressin is actually preparing the male brain for future uh, paternal care behaviours. But if we think about other things that vasopressin does, vasopressin is also associated with water retention these animals live in a very, very, very harsh environment. So it's quite possible that we're seeing some, or we're missing some of these sorts of synergistic effects between vasopressin acting for parental care, but vasopressin also having to be mediated or being moderated to um, work with water conservation. So vasopressin is not the only story here for striped mice. We then have this hormone, which is prolactin. Now, prolactin is a gonadotropic hormone. It's also called the hormone of maternity. So it's the hormone that is primarily associated with maternal care in mammals. We think it's really important for organizing neural substrates because it's a really unique hormone in that it can cross the blood-brain barrier. So it can actually move from the pituitary directly into the brain and actually exert direct effects on the cerebrospinal fluid which is pretty awesome if you think about it for a little hormone. So we know that uh, prolactin is really important for maternal care. So we can make some predictions that if you find high concentrations of prolactin in the male brain, that it's probably going to be associated with parental care as well. And we have some evidence for this in striped mice. So in striped mice, uh, as you can see here, the prolactin concentrations of our breeders, which is this one, is much higher than of our romas. Um, so this does seem to suggest that prolactin is important for paternal care. We also know that tactile cues from offspring can stimulate the production of prolactin and can also basically increase neurogenesis of olfactory neurons, which is pretty cool as well. So you have offspring, creates more neurons in, your, in the, the little mouse nose, which basically increases more reinforcement for stimuli towards offspring. So this seems to be pretty cool. Um, the evidence that we have for this is that in striped mice, experienced males also have higher concentration of prolactin than non-experienced males. 
So experienced males have direct contact with pups. Inexperienced males have never had contact with pups. So we do, again, see this uh, variation in prolactin. One of the problems with prolactin, prolactin is also stimulated by environmental factors. And there's a whole range of different things that actually stimulate the uh, production of prolactin. So we think it's really important, but we don't really know what other sorts of factors could be influencing prolactin. So we have a pretty good idea of at least some of the hormones that are going to be involved in the activation or organization of parental care, paternal care. And there does seem to be some relationship with maternal care. There does seem to be a lot more work that we need to go into to try and understand some of these sorts of interactions and synergistic relationships between hormones. So all of that looks at one aspect of the proximate mechanisms, which are hormones, neuroendocrine factors. We now look at ontogeny or how organisms might develop particular behaviors. And we tend to sort of focus a lot on the, the hormones and things, but we could also take a little bit of a closer look at the genetics. Now, unfortunately, studies of genetics of paternal care are really, really rare. Okay, there's been a few studies and most of them, again, have been done on laboratory rats and mice. So, for example, uh, progesterone knockout uh, male mice actually show much higher levels of um, parental care and reduced infanticide. Some of the genes that we know may be implicated are things like SRY. Um, but we also have other candidate genes that are directly associated with olfaction. Remember, olfaction is really, really important. And these are just a couple that I managed to find uh, doing a literature search that have differential effects on paternal care. Uh, unfortunately, not many of them have actually been tested for their, their effects. They seem to be implicated with some stuff that they do here and maybe in females, and maybe there's a little bit of evidence here in one species, but not in another. But there is evidence here for this particular gene, which is an olfactory gene, uh, CFOS. It's an immediate early gene. So basically all that means is it's expressed really rapidly in response to a stimulus. And in striped mice, again, we're finding that this gene is expressed really rapidly in the medial preoptic area of the brain. And again, this is directly in response to pup exposure. So it does seem that this gene is really, really important for paternal care, but you can see that there's probably a lot more work that needs to be done in this space. Another way that we might look at how parental care develops is to look at uh, heritability of the trait. Now, this can be somewhat difficult, but we can look at quantitative genetics, for example. So we might look at the narrow sense heritability of parental care. Now, unfortunately, these studies are really rare. There's only three that I know of, one of which um, has been done on striped mice. And basically what we found was that there was practically no heritability. And the other two studies have found that in the other species as well. That's very, very low or quite limited. So for grooming behavior from fathers to sons, there's some evidence of heritability, about 19%. But what's really cool is this. And I know it's not paternal care per se, but if you look at the relationship between fathers and daughters for huddling, there's about a 29% heritability there, which is significant. So it seems that fathers are influencing the maternal care behaviors of their mothers or of, the, of their daughters. So they're influencing a different pathway, which is interesting. And keep that in mind because I'm coming back to that in just a second. Now we have indirect genetic effects. So these are going to occur where you have variations in the quality of the environment. So that's the nest or the burrow that are provided by their parents, and these reflect direct genetic differences among them. So parental effects are quite specific uh, indirect genetic effects that occur when parents are influenced by the environment, and then they influence their offspring and get grand offspring's behavior, which is pretty cool. So sometimes we don't see the immediate effect, but we might see the effect transgenerational. Now we know that maternal care is really, really important for maternal care behaviors later. So mothers are really, really critical for influencing the maternal care behavior of their daughters. And some of the work that I've been involved with actually shows that maternal care behavior in striped mice is also really, really important for the development of paternal care in their sons. So what these graphs show you here 
is when a mother or a female raises young without her mate, she actually provides higher levels of, of maternal care towards her own offspring. And then her sons actually provide higher levels of paternal care to their own son or their own offspring. So what you have here is females compensating for the lack of, of parental care, which translates into males becoming good fathers, which is really cool. We've done some more work um, on this, having a look at some of these uh, interactions, and we corroborated this in a paper we published last year, particularly for huddling behavior. So sons that are raised by their mothers only actually huddle their own offspring um, even more. And if you look at what's happening with prolactin here, uh, prolactin is actually not affected whether they're raised by both parents or whether they're raised by their mothers only, which again suggests that it's actual physical tactile uh, stimulation from the offspring that is um, helping them become fathers or is, is causing that maternal, uh, paternal response. The other thing that we can look at when it comes to development is look at whether they might learn or uh, behavior or improve their behavior based on experience. So learning and experience actually change neuro neurobiological patterns in the brain um, and change behavior as a consequence. Now, we don't have a lot of evidence for this. So this, this idea that males might be able to learn observations from their mothers and fathers, and we do have evidence that striped mice can actually learn from their dads. It's not paternal behavior, but they can learn about novel food. Um, so we know that uh, this little uh, guy here, which is Rhabdomus familio, the species I'm talking about, they can actually learn from their fathers, whereas another sp uh, species, which is a grassland species, which is solitary, you can see they are actually not learning from their fathers at all. Okay. We also know that in striped mice, there is this capacity to learn and that parental care can change with age, but it's from the female side. So daughters, when they're young, they only provide about 6% uh, of alloparental care. By the time they sub adults, they're providing about 24% of parental care in the nest, which is pretty impressive. It's a lot of care. We also know that mothers change their experience as they age or change their care as they age. So they provide much lower levels of care to the second litter. So it sucks to be a second child. Um, but they also change their behavior depending on if they mated to an experienced male or whether they mated to a, an inexperienced male or an older male. So females actually show higher levels of care when they mated with an inexperienced male. Now, all of these are going to cascade back and onto that effect that I, I mentioned earlier about how the sons are affected by the mother's maternal care. So we know females are changing their behavior. Do we have the, uh, any data for males? No, okay? And this is true for most species. And probably the reason for this is when you put a male and a female together, it doesn't matter if it's his daughter or his sister, chances are he's going to mate with her. So we generally don't like to have uh, that sort of thing happening. So from an ontogenetic perspective, so a de developmental perspective, we know that some of the olfactory genes appear to be really, really important. We know that there's some evidence that learning and experience might also be important as well. Uh, but there is a lot more work that needs to be done in this space for a full understanding of um, paternal care. Okay, so now we get on to where most behavioral ecologists are really interested in. This is the evolution and function of these behaviors. Now, most people automatically assume that because we're seeing paternal care, it must be beneficial. Uh, it might not necessarily be, and I'll explain why in just a minute. The one thing we are very, very clear on is that paternal care is not universal across mammals, obviously, and it's involved in multiple lineages. Now, this graph is, or this uh, phylogenetic tree is not the easiest to read, but you can see the little dots, hopefully, these little red bits all around sort of sporadically uh, situated. So that's showing, at least for a large number of species where paternal care has been found in the different mammalian lineages. And it's only been demonstrated in 10 mammalian orders. So that's not very many. So we do have evidence in the carnivores. We have evidence in the bats, believe it or not. Uh, the tenrex, which if you've never seen a tenrex, that's this little guy over here. They're really awesome. And no, they're not rodents, even though they look like them. 
Uh, we have some evidence in the Senge, so the little guy down at the bottom, uh, also in the shrews. We have them in some marsupials, not many, but some. Obviously, the rodents, the rabbits, the primates, obviously, and um, also in the cetacea, which are the dolphins and the whales. Um, most of our studies, most of the literature is on the carnivores, the rodents, and the primates. Uh, obvious reasons, it's really easy to keep uh, rodents in captivity, and a lot of the earlier work was done on primates in captivity as well. So all along, I've been talking about the African striped mouse. I, that's actually only one species, okay? So the species is Rhabdomus familio, and it's uh, situated here on the western parts of southern Africa. There are three other species that we know of, and all of them are solitary to as far as we know. What we do know is as soon as you put uh, Rhabdomus delectus, which is this little guy on the right, in the laboratory, they show paternal care. Okay, so this does seem to suggest that paternal care may actually be the ancestral state, which also seems to coincide with the phylogeny of Rhabdomus, where um, Rhabdomus familio does seem to be basal to the clade. So that seems to be pretty good in terms of our evolutionary understanding for this clade. But then it starts to fall apart a little bit. So paternal care we know has evolved independently across multiple lineages, uh, but how it evolved across these different, within these different lineages uh, is heavily debated. Um, so arguments arise over the benefits uh, versus the costs of paternal care. Um, and this is probably a consequence of males themselves. So males' reproductive success is going to be more influenced by the number of matings that they can achieve rather than the number of offspring that they themselves help to raise. Again, because they can't care for offspring when they're in the, the womb, they may as well disappear and go off and find another female to mate with. But generally, when we're thinking about the adaptive significance of the behavior, there's two broad hypotheses that have been proposed to explain the evolution and function of these behavior, of paternal care behaviors. So these are our fitness enhancing hypotheses and our constraints hypotheses. The fitness enhancing hypotheses have suggested that paternal care evolved because the offspring benefit, the mother's benefit, and all the father's benefit. Now, you shouldn't always make the assumption that just because you see the behavior, that it immediately has a fitness benefit to the offspring. Very few studies have actually tested this. Constraints hypothesis are more focused with um, not fitness related benefits, but more that uh, males are constrained in some way, either extrinsically or intrinsically to provide care. So we have seven fitness uh, enhancing hypotheses. Basically the, the first two focus on fitness benefits to offspring. So it's thought that paternal care may contribute to offspring survival, growth or development, particularly when resources are limited. Um, or where there's a risk of infanticide. And to my knowledge, very, very few studies have actually tested whether offspring are actually receiving a fitness benefit by fathers providing care. Uh, one study that I do know of was in California mice and they went, yes, they do, uh, but nobody else has actually really gone that extra step and tested whether the offspring are benefiting. So the offspring could be receiving the behavior, but it might not actually be contributing to their growth, survival or development. In striped mice, we only found some support for this for the male care hypothesis last year. So we, know, we do know that juveniles are, are less anxious, which is probably good for them because it means they're more exploratory, they'll go out and find food. Striped mice are solitary foragers, so they can't rely on anybody else. So if you're bold, you'll hopefully find more food. Our sub-adults are less aggressive or, and more amicable. So this is probably good in a nest where you might get beaten up by older males. We also know that our older males, so our adults, are more aggressive if they've received paternal care from their fathers. Now, this is great because basically they are the ones that go out and defend harms of females. So you want to be aggressive. You want to be big and strong because it's going to allow you to access a resource. The paternity certainty hypothesis basically postulates that paternal care evolves because there's limited opportunities for extra pair copulations. And so males are really sure that the offspring are theirs. It's thought that certainty of paternity must um, coincide with an ability to recognize offspring, but this may not always be the case. So striped mice we know are able to recognize their offspring. Uh, and we know that 
they don't mate with offspring with which they are familiar. However, this is uh, what we call familiarity by prior association. Because if you take offspring away from their fathers and let them be raised in isolation of their dads, their dads will quite happily mate with their daughters. They don't actually recognize them as biological kin. We also know that striped mice are quite capable of recognizing individual group members. So they will beat up other individuals who come into their little native territories. But again, this is familiarity by prior association. So if you disrupt these systems, they don't actually recognize um, genetic kin. So here, although the system does sort of seem to suggest that paternity certainty is high, it's probably not the reason why we see paternal care in striped mice. This doesn't mean that it's not going to be an explanation in other species, but in striped mice, it's not the explanation. And there's few studies that actually have rigorously tested this. If we look at whether or not paternal care might actually be beneficial to fathers rather than to offspring, it might be that paternal care is a, a sort of a commodity that females will actually value. So here, investing in offspring is actually more about mating effort rather than the actual investment per se. So basically the idea behind this hypothesis or the predictions is that females will be able to uh, basically control um, access to things, but they'll also be able to pick males that they want for mating. So males will, they, they'll choose males with particular qualities. There's very, very few studies that provide any support for this. Uh, in striped mice, there's no support for this at all. Females don't care if the male's a good dad. What they care about is if he's old. Um, so that's good for some species. They also care if he's experienced, but they don't care if he's a better father or not. Um, there is some uh, suggestion that in Brazilian guinea pigs, this may be the case. So females may actually be preferring males that are better dads. This particular hypothesis doesn't apply to striped mice at all. Um, basically, the idea with the agonistic buffering hypothesis is that males are using offspring as social tools to basically reduce uh, their own aggression. So in particular species where you have very large dominant males who might beat up smaller males, you're able to take a baby and go, please don't hit me. Um, then you don't get hit, hit by the larger male or punished by the larger male. So striped mice, this doesn't apply. They don't use their offspring as social tools, but many species of primates do. So in particular, uh, primate species that live in very, very large groups, we know that lots of the younger males actually pick up babies, will look after them, will care for them because they don't get um, beaten up by the dominant males. So in one species in particular, we know of is the Barbary macaques. We can also look at whether paternal care might have evolved because it has benefits to females. So the first of these is the female harassment hypothesis. So here the idea is that paternal care has evolved as a byproduct of females actually seeking protection for themselves or for, for their offspring because males in many species are infanticidal. So here the idea is, is that if you uh, are associating with one particular male, he will look after your young and prevent it from being eaten by another male. Now, we know with striped mice that they hold territories, so males are defending territories, and they are keeping other males away. But in striped mice, it's actually not the males that are infanticidal. So if a male comes into a territory, he doesn't immediately go and kill the offspring. What we do know is it's the females who are infanticidal. So there's very high levels of reproductive competition in females. Um, and females uh, establish dominance hierarchies within the nest, which is really, really cool. So the female harassment hypothesis can't explain why we see paternal care. But the interesting thing in striped mice here, where we have female harassment, a big dominant females actually produce more young. So they have higher reproductive output. So this is a great fitness benefit for them in a nest. But the younger subordinate females, they produce fewer offspring but they provide more care. This increases their likelihood of survival. More care means better sons, better fathers. So there's some really complex sorts of relationships which are going on here, which is really, really cool. But at the end of the day, the female harassment hypothesis can't explain paternal care in striped mice, even though there is some harassment, but not from males. 
The load lightning hypothesis has a lot of support from species like meerkats. Uh, you're all well familiar with meerkats and the fact that they babysit and they look after their babies and they, um, they learn how to um, eat scorpions and things from watching their mothers and fathers and cousins and so on. But the load lightning hypothesis has a lot of uh, good ideas behind it. So in mammals, lactation is really expensive. It costs a lot of energy to, to basically produce milk. So the idea here with the load lightning hypothesis is that paternal care has evolved to help reduce some of this uh, energetic cost towards females. So if males provide food for the females, then they can invest that energy into milk production. Or if males are looking after the offspring, then what they, they can do is the females can go off and find food and put the energy into milk again. So I've spoken about this to a degree. Okay, so we know that female striped mice, when they raise young uh, together with a mate, are reducing care. Okay, this suggests that there is load lightning by that male. So if you take the male away, females increase their care, they compensate for a lack of care, providing um, up to one and a half times more care in the absence of a mate. So we know that the male does seem to be lightening the load. Uh, but the thing is here is that young daughters are also lightening the load. So it doesn't have to be a male who provides the care. It can be pretty much anything. So because we have some other uh, sorts of um, individuals who can lighten the load, this is not explaining exclusively why we see paternal care in striped mice. So it might be important for species like meerkats, but doesn't seem to be important for striped mice. So fitness enhancing or fitness related hypotheses uh, do seem to have some merit for explaining the evolution of paternal care in some species, but there's definitely no universal answer for why we see paternal care in mammals or in some mammals. So this leads me on to the constraints hypotheses then. So again, here, these are related to non-fitness benefits. So it's something which is forcing males to provide paternal care. So it's constraining them. Now, I've already mentioned that males, their reproductive, reproductive success is affected more by how many uh, females they can basically mate with rather than the number of offspring that they help to raise. So if you're a really competitive male and you're really, really good at inseminating females, you're going to have more offspring. So this is going to be really good for you. But the problem with this is that if you're aggressive, if you're very, very dominant, testosterone costs a lot of energy. Okay, now that energetic costs might actually constrain what sorts of behaviors you're able to perform. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we do seem to see a trade off in these territorial striped mouse breeders. So they experience lower testosterone uh, concentrations than the roamers, even though they are aggressive. So testosterone being very energetically costly to produce has the side effect of causing increased aggression, which you don't necessarily want to produce or to show to your offspring. The other problem with these males is producing higher con concentrations of testosterone means you inhibit corticosterone. Now, corticosterone is the thing which mobilizes glucose and gives you energy. So when you have the in inhibiting effects of testosterone, you don't have as much um, energy in order to engage in particular behaviors. So it does seem that there's some sorts of uh, phyla, uh, um, physiological constraints that might be involved in the expression of paternal care in these males. And because hormones are quite flexible, this could be uh, a part of the story as to why we sometimes see paternal care in these, uh, in these animals and at other times not. But we also have the social constraints hypothesis, which does seem really appealing uh, for striped mice. So here the idea is that males are actually constrained socially from securing additional mating opportunities. And what this predicts is that males are going to be de defending exclusive territories and then females disperse into those territories. And then the males basically uh, protect the females and, um, from rival uh, males. And they then uh, paternal care will evolve as a byproduct of that constrained sociality. So we would predict that males would be uh, paternal towards their young, they'd show positive interactions and, and so on. And we do see this in striped mice. This is pretty much what we're seeing. We're seeing the fact that males are amicable, they're dominating these little harms of females. And the other cool thing about this is when you take away those social constraints, uh, they do change their behaviors. So when we actually take, uh, unfortunately, experimentally, we take 
uh, individuals away from their nesting sites and free up nesting sites, striped mice disperse like nothing else on Earth. Okay, and this is because females experience reproductive competition. So when a nest site opens up, they disappear. So they, they don't actually want to really be social. They prefer to be solitary. So it does seem to suggest that there's social constraints that are causing males to be paternal. Uh, the one caveat here, with this hypothesis, it says that males dominate the resource and females move into it, while in striped mice it's the other way around. Females dominate the resource and males then dominate the females. So this leads us to the last hypothesis, which is the ecological constraints hypothesis. So here, this suggests that individuals are constrained to provide paternal care because of environmental factors. So when you have uh, difficulty in terms of dispersing because it's a really resource poor environment or it's a harsh environment, what you might have is you might have grouping or sociality evolving and then paternal care evolving as a byproduct of enforced sociality. Now, in striped mice, what we know is in the succulent karoo, they nest in these bushes, which you can see up here, which is Zygophyllum rectofractum. And this is a really, really limited resource. Um, and these guys like to nest in there. And it's a limited resource because there's not many of them. And these little guys over here are fiercely competitive for the same resource. So these are bush karoo rats. Now, in September, October, November, in the succulent karoo, it rains and there's a flush of food. There's lots of insects, there's flowers. Uh, if any of you have heard of Namaqualand, uh, there's lots of flowers, there's lots of food. What happens when you have lots of food? You have an increase in population density. So the females move into these nests or into these uh, bushes. They're constrained to nest together because there's not many of them. And so the males actually then come and dominate these small harems of females. And because they can't go out and find additional females. They provide paternal care. So it does seem that the ecological constraints hypothesis explains paternal care in African striped mice, or is our best explanation for paternal care in striped mice. But that's where it ends, because this little guy down here, which lives in the same environment and lives in the same bushes and competes for the same resource, is not paternal. So ecological cons constraints only explain some uh, patterns of paternal care in some species. So constraints related hypothesis, hypotheses are important for some species, but not others. So I hope at the end of that, after 20 years of research, you can see that we know a bit, but there is still so much more that we actually don't know. Striped mice are one of the best studied species from an integrated perspective. So we're starting to really piece together how these different factors are interacting to affect paternal care. What's complicated is paternal care is so flexible in the species, which we don't see in other naturally biparental species. So there's still a lot of work for us to do. I hope it's given you some insights into just how complex what we think behavior actually is. And hopefully at the end of the day, you've enjoyed uh, learning a little bit more about a species I grew to know and love very desperately. Um, and that there's so much more work that we can do on the species. So maybe in another 20 years, I'll be talking to you about a more integrated understanding of paternal care in the striped mouse. Thank you for your attention. Um, and this is just a few of the people who I've, very kindly taken some of their work from uh, to talk about today and some of the research, oh, the funding um, bodies that have supported our research.